Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton. Blood spatter shook free of a blade with one smart flick. And today it is time for episode 2 of my Ghost Runner Let's Play. One quick note before we dive in. My schedule is still Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I might occasionally miss an episode due to all of my horrible illnesses flaring up again. You wouldn't think an AI-driven logistical hub at Lagrange Point 2 would be capable of getting sick, and yet. Anyway, let's dive into level 3, The Climb. It was a genuine surprise to burst out of the noisy cyber world into the quietness of reality. Our first stop is one of the few remaining cybervoid mainframes, located in an old mining tower. We can use it to correct the corrupted parts of your code, and hopefully, restore your more sophisticated functions. Hopefully. There's no guarantee the data will be intact, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Hmm. I don't mention this much, but I went to art school when I was younger. One of my strongest artistic fascinations were tangled, dense, layered industrial spaces. Ones with pipes and cables and clutter. Wonder if that has anything to do with how much I like this game. Our goal lies far above, at the core of Dharma City. This means we'll need to get out of the base district. With the chaos the rebels caused, it's going to be troublesome. How can you assist me? In combat, I'm afraid I can't. Cybervoid Remnant is the only medium I can interact with. I will be able to help you with your upgrades once we find the mainframe. Apart from that, just think of me as a voice in your head. One that you should listen to if you want to stay alive. This game is absolutely gorgeous, and unfortunately, my, due to hardware quirks, my recording software can't quite capture it. It's genuinely more beautiful than many, like, AAA games, and it was made by an indie studio. I'm forced to conclude that they must be staffed primarily by sorcerers. Ah, the Strategic Raspberry Jam Conserve. Established in 2166 to ensure the continuity of toast in the event of a catastrophe. Unfortunately, it's been useless since the Great Cranberry Jelly Contamination of 2182. This is Zoe Avila of the Climbers' Rebellion. If there's anybody alive out there, please respond. You said they were dead. They are. Except for her, it seems. No one will answer this broadcast. Trust me. I keep track of any potential assets, and a single, desperate survivor is no asset. The Keymaster Guard is patrolling the area. They may have located the mainframe. Can they use it? No, but they can destroy it, like they did to most of the Cybervoid hardware. This is Zoe Avila of the Climbers. Please, can anybody hear me? Anybody? This is... Ghost Runner. The Ghost Runner? Jack, you're awake! Yes. How? We've been rebuilding you for months. We tried everything we could to wake you up, but you never won. It wasn't up to me. One quirk of recording is, is that you can actually go a lot faster through these environments than I do. I actually need to slow down and smell the roses more often, both to give myself time to talk, but also because you can actually outrun the game's dialogue triggers, causing characters to interrupt one another, cut each other off, or for entire chunks of dialogue to just get cancelled. Doesn't happen often, but it's very irritating when it does. If you were there when they came for us, it would have been different. We might have had a chance. What are you going to do? The fifth is still crawling with keys. Keys? Oh, uh, the Keymaster Guard, bandits and thugs that Mara armed and sent against us. I'm going after. After the Keymaster? Alone? That's insane. But if anyone can do it, it's definitely you. You're gonna need someone to guide you and keep an eye out for threats. What do you say? Want my help? Yes. Good. 
I need to move to a safer location and hook up to the network. I'll contact you once I scrounge up some gear. Zoe out. Zoe's dialogue in the previous room is a great example of how voice actors in games usually aren't given correct voice direction or any at all. They do great jobs with individual line reads, but because they aren't told how lines relate to one another or not, and are often given their lines out of order, there's frequent weird tonal mismatches between two sentences that are supposed to lead into one another, or just stresses in completely the wrong place. Do you really need the assistance of a failed rebel when you already have my help? They fixed me. Barely. I'd been waiting for them to properly rebuild you, but Mara cut their time short. Why didn't you contact them? The climbers? To what purpose? The poor souls never stood a chance against Mara. Fixing you was the only thing they could help me with, and they were already on it. The mainframe we're after used to run all of the Sector 5's operations. That's where we are, in case you were wondering. They're closing in on the server room. Hurry. Can't it be accessed remotely? We wouldn't be here if it could. Cyber Void has been fractured, broken into countless disconnected pieces. It's like puddles of water, left over after the lake has been drained. The faster you go, the less accurate your enemies are. It's absolutely not a game to play methodically. Always be jumping, always be wall running, always be moving the maximum possible speed. Yes. This is it. Jump in. This place again. This place is where we'll find the means to fight our enemy. What do I do? It's in your instincts to navigate the cyber void. In most cases, you'll just have to focus on finding the right direction. There's four main cyber void segments in the game, not counting the expositional previous one, and they each bear a puzzle. Luckily, this one's trivialized by the diagram. The cyber void's a good moment to breathe away from the fast paced main game, but puzzles themselves are kind of anodyne and feel a little bit out of place. After you're done with this particular jumble of code, you'll gain access to one of a ghost runner's most useful abilities. Look what these rebels did to your protocols. That's what happens when amateurs mess with perfection. I need you to start putting in some effort. Luckily. Finally. Excellent. Sometimes you will need to close in and attack simultaneously. Let me give you something to aim at. Focus. Visualize yourself in space. Perfect form. Once more, take a breath. Picture your destination. Yes, you got it! The enemies won't line up for you. Adapt to their movements. Splendid! They are literally lining up as he speaks. You can even use this technique to cut through projectiles. Give it a try. Very convenient, is it not? There's a lot of samurai honor symbolism going on around the Ghost Runners in this setting, which partly is just an artifact of cyberpunk as a genre, but I think is also supposed to be a subtle element of the storytelling. After all, it's an effective control mechanism. Clean up the stragglers and we can proceed. I'll just leave. No! We've worked hard to reconnect this node to the network. If they destroy it, we'll be affected. We? Let me put it another way. I cannot exist without Cyber Void, and you cannot exist without me. Normally I'd be like, from this evidence we can conclude that the society really cared a lot about emulsified egg products, but I prefer to believe that mayonnaise is simply the name of the guy depicted on the billboard. No, fun fact, that billboard is actually what inspired my title art for this series. These are just bandits loyal to the Keymaster, used by her to keep the base under control. 
You can expect more competent foes as we move higher up the tower. I don't mention this a lot because it is, and I quote, a massive flex, but I actually do all of the channel art, title cards, stream overlays, and so on myself. So, you know, factor that into my annual evaluation. There'll be plenty more examples to talk about this as we go on, but there's something magical about the way this game renders objects in space. They dangle and relate to one another physically in a way that's got a strange realism to it, and I can't quite describe why. Partly it's the lighting, partly it's the absurdly high object detail, and as we'll see more later, it's partly about the really good atmospheric lighting, dust clouds and fogs. As I've said, it doesn't come through perfectly on the recording, but while playing, I'm constantly struck by how much this game looks like another game's cutscene. It feels like playing in the pre-rendered backdrops, but with so much higher resolution and higher fidelity in old games than the actual gameplay polygons. Mara killed a hundred ghost runners. Ninety-nine, to be precise. What of it? How am I to fight her alone? The climbers replaced many of your parts. There were a few they couldn't find. Mara's kill switch among them, which means she can't shut you down again. Make no mistake, this fight won't be easy, but at least it will be fair. Also, in later levels when I die a lot, I'll edit out almost all of the deaths, but there's no reason not to leave a couple in here. The death counter pop-ups, however, will also include any deaths I edit out, to maintain a true and accurate reflection of exactly how mortal I am. That's the last of them. Time to get back on track. Where to? Dharma City, of course. We'll need to use Amida Elevator Station. That's the fastest route by far. The base is Dharma's foundation, in more than one sense. It is the lifeblood of the tower's economy. Back in the Golden Age, there were enough goods produced here to satisfy the needs of all the residents. Of course, the upper levels had certain privileges. During Mara's coup, many of the facilities were damaged. Things have been in slow decline ever since. Nowadays, the area mostly serves as warehouses or gang hideouts, and a reminder of what Dharma used to be. Which is... Home. A safe haven for the survivors of the apocalypse. You built this whole place? I conceived it, designed it, and built it. I am the architect. Your optimization has improved, but it's far from perfect. We'll need to make another stop before visiting the Keymaster. You can actually just jump right from the top of that whole platforming section to the bottom if you're careful, which saves several seconds, which does matter for leaderboard times. As you can see, I'm on par for deaths, but a little bit behind on time. Although, funnily enough, because I could record several runs of each level in order to try and get not the one which is the highest skill display, but the one which is the best, smoothest viewing experience, I actually beat that time on one of my subsequent attempts. I just never quite got a smoother playthrough than this one. Anyway, it's time once again to visit... The Collectible Zone. I need to come up with some kind of a jingle for going to The Collectible Zone. There's actually a surprising bounty in this chapter of the game. After one only for the first two levels, in this one we've actually got two ornaments, a sword, and an audio log. So let's take a look at the sword first, because swords are extremely cool. The uh, first unlocked sword of the game, the uh, Suru GR-74. Not a lot to say about it, it's, uh, it's an interesting, you know, sci-fi cyberpunky counterpart to the uh, Seisuken, which is your default sword. These are the two archetypes of swords that you find in the game. Most of them are recolors or of one or the other of these models, as you can see if we zip through some of the other ones, but uh, that's a slight hint for future episodes. Surugi is just the Japanese word for a straight sword rather than a curved sword like a katana. Uh, so it's kind of just a fun portmanteau that this is the Suru GR because they are ghost runners. This is presumably the sword which our ghost runner had at the start because it is, of course, the Suru GR 74, and we are Ghost Runner 74. 
Which makes me wonder where the Seisuken comes from. I personally am going to conclude that this it was found, scrounged, or created for us by the Climber Rebellion who repaired us, which uh, we'll find out plenty more about as we go along. There's various other uh, Suru GR weapons, and um, the architect will actually tell us about it in-game at some point. But yeah, so that's everything we need to know about the one sword that we've found so far. In the codex, let's just listen to the audio log, audio log one, which we found. Hard to believe it's been almost 40 years since we've been stranded here. Back then, I was sure we would be gone by now, one way or another. At least Arma City turns out to be a success. The new generation doesn't know what it's missing, and can't miss what it doesn't know. A fun exercise in social engineering. Oh well. The blaze, the splendor, and the symmetry. I cannot see but darkness. Death and darkness. Even here, into the center of repose, the shady visions come to domineer. All we really need is more time. More time. He's quoting Keats there, by the way, in his unfinished poem Hyperion. Adam's casting himself into the role of Hyperion, the last titan to retain any divine power as the Olympian gods cast them down. Fitting for, as we'll see, the self-aggrandizing builder of humanity's final holdout in a dead world. The specific lines he quotes are Hyperion expressing the fears that now invade his mind as he sits in the fading glory of his palace, the realization that even the lone survivor must eventually also fall. This doesn't exactly gel with his then-current moment, one of Triumph having succeeded in building that refuge, but it does nicely foreshadow the way his narrative develops, and gives us an important insight into how the character sees himself. Dignified, cultured, and the last god standing in the ashes of the world, one with an entirely rightful claim to that divine authority. It's either a surprisingly deep illusion to be made in a game like this, or it's a fantastic, admirable act of pretension. I don't know to what extent the, uh meaningful nouns they've selected for this game are purposeful creative decisions as opposed to simply something that sounds cool. Dharma City sounds cool, but is it relevant and important that it is named that? Is it is it actually a reference to the metaphysical concept of Dharma? I may ramble about this later if I find the space to, or I may not, who knows. Um, but the game is chock-a-block with these kind of like pleasantly evocative nouns. We'll find out more about this Adam guy a bit later on, but is it relevant that he's named Adam? Is it relevant that the city is Dharma City? Is it relevant even that the elevator to which we're heading is called Amida Elevator, which is the Japanese name for a bodhisattva, specifically one who oversees a kind of divine realm? Because I think if you wanted to, you could reach pretty deep and uh, make all of these inferences about what was intended by the people who created this game, but given the generally not super complex nature of, of the game's setting, I'm inclined to believe they just picked evocative nouns that sounded good. Certainly, there's very little actual depth to the world as we as we get shown it. It's, it's your basic, you know, uh, post-apocalyptic cyberpunk dystopia city. It's got some fun elements, but there's nothing especially super unique about it. The hood ornament earring. A fair number of cars were parked at the base level during the burst. They all fell into disuse due to impracticality, but their parts still reappear from time to time in various forms. Can of coffee. Coffee was a rare commodity even right after the burst. Nowadays, getting something that even remotely resembles the real thing is a cause for celebration. Most bases drink it only on special occasions. I think a huge amount of love went into this game, and I think that this is evidence of that. Is the story it tells super, super duper deep? Not really. But I think the loving rendering of these objects is evidence enough that these people really cared about what they made. And that's one of the things that I find most appealing in an artistic work, is that the person making it really, really just unironically loved what they were doing. Anyway, I guess that's it for me today. I guess some of these episodes might be a bit shorter than usual, but this one managed to pretty much hit exactly my goal of a 20 minute episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you join me again next time. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. 
I also stream on Twitch and I now have a Discord server for stream scheduling. You can contribute to my existence on Ko-fi or Patreon, and all of those links are in the video description. Thanks so much for watching.